Oh, well, we now have 100 participants, which is fantastic. If you guys are neurodivergent and don't mind letting people know, do a little thumbs up again, because it would just be interesting to see. Nice. It's a good chunk. Today, I must, uh, you know, warning, um, this is very much from experts by experience. It's a controversial subject in, a, in, in different parts. So just take it that this is my outlook. Well, to tell you a bit about myself, I'm Nat and I'm the head of community at Exceptional Individuals. Exceptional Individuals, we, we are in some ways a recruitment agency, but in more ways it goes way, way beyond that because we support individuals who resonate with neurodivergent conditions. Now, the important word there is resonate because a lot of people need to have a statement or a diagnosis to get support. And that's just not what we do. We're like, if you think that the way your mind works resonate with some of the things we're going to mention today, you can get support from us. Oh, I'm loving all the love and cat symbols. Why I think this is really important is that the majority there, it's not great, but there's fantastic, well, there is some fantastic support available to young people and children when it comes to early years. But when you leave college or university or apprenticeships or whatever and go into the real world, it's very tough. You know, there's no support. It just kind of drops off. And if there is support available, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg. So this is why Matt set up Exceptional Individuals like four or five years ago now. And I joined in the last two coming up three. And we specialize in dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism and ADHD, but we also cover the entire spectrum. Um, just so you know a bit about myself, I have dyslexia, I have dyspraxia, I have mild autism and a little bit of OCD, which well, I got diagnosed with tendencies whatever that means, you know. So I'll give you, and all, a lot of my cousins have ADHD, bless them. <laughs> so I, I feel like I know quite a lot from the personal ground, but always learning, always educating. What is Exceptional Individuals? As mentioned, we help recruit talent. So if an organization is bored of hiring the same people time and time again and expecting different results, well, they're going to want to look to more innovative brain types and us people, us, you know, we are the definition of like innovators. Um, that being said, as there are massive positives, there are also downsides and the downsides predominantly relate to the way that we've crafted society in a typical way rather than the actual condition itself. So we help employers with the things that, the difficulties and make them less challenging and the things that they thrive in really give them the platform to smash it. We also do workplace needs assessments. So if any of you people resonate with what I'm saying today and feel like maybe your workplace could do with being a bit more accessible, get in contact and we'll see if we can help out. Um, quite a lot of time it's free through the government so it's definitely worth if you're in the UK at least to get in touch and we also do workshops and guides like this one today so if you guys can see this background this is our team and we are 80% neurodivergent so we've got myself who has a whole heap of things Matt's dyslexic, Shanna Dawes uh, has autism, we've got another Matt who has Tourette's uh we've got dyspraxia we, we, we've got the whole spectrum and it's a really great environment so as well as helping people get into jobs doing their cvs interviews you know the old uh, that stuff we also deliver free events very similar to this one and they we do them for people who want to learn more but also people who are neurodivergent or think they may be but just want some guidance now, the thing that we've noticed is that the biggest challenge or barrier tends to be communication in one way or another. Either you talk too much or not enough. Either you've got all the ideas and can't get it out. So we created a range of workshops focused around communicating in different ways. So in the top left, we've got an animation class. We have done public speaking. We've done filmmaking. And at first it might seem a little bit random, but when you realize it's more about finding other ways to get your point across, 
you realize why it's so relevant and important. I would like to hear from you guys. What would you like to learn about neurodiversity today? Okay, and I cannot promise, but I'll try my absolute best to touch upon all these points. And at the end, if we have time to do a bit of question and answers. So we've got what accommodations can employers provide to support the neurodivergent staff? We will mention that. Disclosure, to disclose or not disclose, that is the question. Access to work, good workplace adjustments, understanding what it covers, um, extra, I'm going to start a job, um, or else I'm neurodivergent, uh, should we be stop, should we ditch the label? Very good point. I'm just going to touch on that one quickly. I'm not a big fan of labels, just putting it out there. However, for the purpose of this, it, it's very helpful to have a word to use. Um, how do you encourage someone you manage to understand their neurodiversity? Great knowledge to reduce anxiety of higher education. Is social phobias common? Gain a better understanding to work with schools. Disclosing when interviewing, better support, HR manager, uh, treatment. Wow, we have uh, some good ones here. Well, guys, as we, there's literally, well, there's not literally hundreds, there's at least more than 10, but some really good ones there. And I definitely address a fair few of them. All right, now I'm going to pass the screen over to Matt, and he's just going to play a very short introduction video on exceptional individuals that one of our amazing volunteers, Carl, made. Found that 74% of people don't disclose they are neurodivergent. 65% of employers don't have accessible online applications. 61% don't know how to cater for their needs in interviews. And shockingly, 74% lack understanding about neurodiversity. So, we decided to do something. We formed a team of neurodiverse people to run the first employment agency to address these challenges. We connected with inclusive employers around the UK, helping them find and benefit from neurodivergent talent. And last year, we facilitated 116 work placements. We designed workshops and audits to help businesses understand how to build more inclusive companies and for our neurodivergent audience. We offered training and mentoring, giving them the confidence to succeed in jobs and supported them throughout their employment journeys. We've also started to promote neurodiversity nationally, appearing on so why is it, despite so many dyslexic people being great problem solvers, many still find it difficult to get work in London? And we felt like we needed to do something about that. What do you think that biggest barrier is then? Is it about the application process? Hoping to turn this around is the UK's first dyslexic job agency. Matt Boyd has set up a service to help people like Annalise get past the written application stage to get a job. And this is just the beginning. We have expanded internationally, working in India and America, raising awareness and changing the conversation around neurodiversity. Want to know more? Check out our website at www.exceptionalindividuals.com. Oh, nice. Always amazing when it works. All right, guys, we've still got people joining consistently. Uh, so. Matt, I kindly ask if you could keep a lookout for the waiting room, just because uh, I think they're piling up. <laughs> but yeah, that gives you an idea. And April, who's in this uh, chat, April, can you give us a wave? Yeah, April did, rightly so, did this scripting and storyboard for that video. So now, guys, we're going to do a bit of a quiz, because who hasn't done enough quizzes during lockdown, eh? All right, what age group is most likely to disclose their neurodiversity? Is it the 18 to 30 year olds, the 31 to 40 year olds, the 41 to 60 year olds, or the 61 to 80 plus? It's the most likely to tell their manager that they have something like dyslexia, dyspraxia, autism, ADHD, dyscraphia, dyscalculia, <laughs> OCD, Tourette's. Woo, nice. And yes, the majority of you got it right. Now, 
why do you guys think that the younger uh, demographic are more likely to disclose? Yeah, so I, from what you guys are telling me, it's that they're more likely to accept it's normal. The younger demographic tend to be more open around these things, are more likely to get diagnosed. Oh, employers are more likely to help younger people, interesting. Less stigma. And all of these things are right. And think about it, like if you've been told your whole life, like, oh, dyslexia, you know, it becomes more norm and accepted. But typically those who are over 30 may not even know they're diagnosed, but, sorry, may not even know they are on the spectrum of some sort. And there's also a stigma, even though people are trying really hard to do it. What of these billionaires is not neurodivergent? So a billionaire that isn't. It's Steve Jobs from Apple, Bill Gates from Microsoft, Richard Branston from Virgin, or Elon Musk from Tesla. So which one of these billionaires is not, to the best of our knowledge, neurodivergent? Now, bear in mind, this is because some people are diagnosed, others resonate, and other people are highly suspected. So this is where we're getting this from. <laughs> well, apparently Richard Branston might be a sociopath. Don't know about that one. But for the others, interestingly, um, it is Elon Musk. Now, I always like to say is that uh, he might not be neurodivergent, but he's got something going on. But Steve Jobs, dyslexic, Bill Gates resonates with being autistic, and Richard Branson also dyslexic. What solution can best support neurodiverse talent flourish? So in your own opinion, what do you think would make the biggest difference? Is it removing psychometric tests? So things that judge personality and one answer fits everything or accessible information. So making things on the website easier to find out about how to get support, workplace adjustments or awareness training. Which one do you think will have the biggest impact? Interesting, nice. And I said, people normally always do awareness training just because I'm delivering it right now. And I always think suck ups, but no, it really does make a big difference. And workplace adjustments, they really do not have to be big things. For instance, just having headphones in the office makes a world of difference to me to help me concentrate. But all of them, like even psychometric tests are a nightmare for people who have a very different way of thinking. All right, well done, Alex. Okay, so we're there now. The correct answer is all of them. Susan Boyle, uh, autism. Holly Willoughby from the TV, she's dyslexic. Um, Justin Timberlake, ADHD. Daniel Radcliffe, dyspraxia. And David Beckham has OCD. And we don't want to focus too much on celebrities. They're a little bit like unattainable when you try to say, oh, well, this person has it. You know, you can survive too but for some people it's really great to see like the potential like where you can go none of these people got to where they got to because despite the way their brain thinks but quite honestly because of the way their brain thinks so differently and that is one of the main major things about neurodiversity in the right setting it can be a mega advantage now these are the most popular, well, no, the most common uh, neurodivergences out there. So dyslexia, um, in a nutshell, is around words. Dyspraxia is kind of more physical uh, dyslexia, so how the brain kind of interprets external information, so it can affect balance, coordination, speech, anything like that. Autism is a very unique one. It's like seeing the world in a different way not wrong, but different. ADHD is kind of like the brain on hyperdrive. Um, doesn't always have to be hyperactive though. OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, dyscalculia. It's kind of like dyslexia of the maths world, but not really. It's more like, you know the information in your head, you know the formulas, but the brain confuses the symbol. And um, a lot of people suspect Albert Einstein was dyscalculic. Tourette's is like when you have tics and your brain kind of gets stuck on a rut and it ends up like repeating messages. Um, it's to do with like endorphins and things like that. And dysgraphia is uh, it's similar to the others, but it's more like, you know, you could have really bad handwriting, but extremely intelligent. You could be bad with directions. 
you the coordination from up here to like down there like just doesn't match um but again there's i definitely have that one nat someone's asked can you explain why ocd comes under neurodiversity yes so we got that um minute, let me see where the comments are we got that recently i got our sat and is it neurodiversity well i think the term is very broad and wide but my definition or our definition is that it's a different thought pattern it's the brain thinking in a different way and the majority of the ones we mentioned is are not disabilities or they don't have to be disabilities dyslexia to autism you know and adhd is a different way of the brain solving problems now mental health isn't directly part of neurodiversity you know it's just it's separate but there is an overlap because li living in a world which doesn't suit your way of thinking and having that way it is going to like cause stress and anxiety so mental health is far higher so it is true that ocd for example does cross into the mental health section but it, there is a lot of overlaps as channeled in the right way it doesn't have to be a negatives now on this one this is like a called the spiky profile that's how we measure neurodivergence now on your phones if you guys just like rate how good you are in each of these areas it will give us a good idea about how diverse this group is now the best way to understand if someone is neurodivergent or not is to understand like the profile and if you are for instance quite good at most things like a good all-rounder then you're probably not neurodivergent but if for instance you're like you really struggle in some areas but over excel in others then that's a good sign of neurodivergence. If you are, for instance, bad at everything, that's not. Neurodivergence isn't about deficit, it's about fluctuation of ability, and that's the best way to know. Now, the bigger the group you ask, the more well-rounded it should be. So if you see here, it's pretty much a neat circle, meaning that we have a very balanced group. But when we work with people in a room that, like last night, when I was with a room of people who were just dyspraxic, for instance, they had a real strong spike at creativity, but a real deficit in like relationships and math. And, math. and by understanding your strengths and weaknesses, you're able to support, prop up and help the things that are more challenging, but also go and find jobs and career paths and routes that really highlight the things that you're already succeeding in and that's our main approach so just to give you guys now a quick overview on the main ones and hopefully this will give you guys a good base level knowledge first of all what is it like to be dyslexic try reading this what's on my screen out loud and it'll give you like a good idea so if you're anything like most people, you'll probably be able to read all of it okay-ish. Like, you know, it takes a bit longer, but you can read it. But when you get to this word here, you won't be able to read it. And this for me is dyslexia. It's not being dumb. It's not being stupid. It's that the brain learns in a different way. So the way that most brains understand like English and written communication is they break it apart and join it together with structures already like determined. But I see words as like, as like stagnant images. So the more I see the word, the more my brain remembers what it is and what it said. I don't remember how to join the word together. I remember the image of it. So that's why I'm getting better and better and people with dyslexia can improve. But when you find a word you've never seen before, it's not like you can work it out. It, it, it's like you're starting from scratch and it is different for everyone, but that's the way that it affects um, a fair few people. So again, really important, people with dyslexia, the very, very vast majority can read, can write, are actually pretty good at it but they're still gonna make the odd mistake here and there, and it's not a determinant of ability. Okay, dyspraxia. 
So dyspraxia, I like to think, is it has a lot of similar outputs as dyslexia, but where dyslexia is like, you do not currently have the knowledge in your head, you see words and your brain interprets it and sometimes gets it a bit muddled up. Dyspraxia is more like you have this information, it's trying to go into your brain, but there's like a funnel and it's only letting like little bits of information in at a time. And that's why there can be like delays. So say you're speaking with someone um, who's dyspraxic and they don't reply, they're like, you might be quick to assume that they do not understand, you know, oh, this person, why do, they're not going to get the job. But actually, what's more likely is that they do understand, but the brain is processing. So the best way to get at, um, information out of someone who's dyspraxic, and bear in mind, I'm a trustee of dyspraxic me, so uh, we work on it a lot of the time. It's about asking in small segments. So rather saying, can you put the kettle on and then take the bins out? That's like two separate bolts of information. You say, can you put the kettle on? Once the kettle is done, then can you pick the bins out? By breaking up questions, it makes it far easier for the brain to like digest. And it also is the case in meetings. So always do notes, always do bullet points, make things as easy as possible to, for those words to go through that funnel. All it is is like ripping information up and allowing it to kind of flow better. And it's also why people often refer it to as clumsy disorder, which is offensive, by the way. Um, but it's because, for instance, when you're like cycling, you know, you, you kind of got to be quite quick on the mark and having a slight delay can result in doom. That's why a lot of people with dyspraxia do not drive, um, though they absolutely can. And that's very important to know. It just means they have to put a bit more work into getting it right. Okay, guys, some great questions. I promise you I will answer soon. Another way that I like to display, explain um, dyspraxia is that imagine if every time someone asked you a question, you had to solve like a puzzle before you could answer it. And normally in life, the quicker you answer, the more likely someone believes in your credibility. Uh, so if it's taking you quite a while to answer, even though you know the answer, you're at a disadvantage. So this is why when people ask for extra time, they're not taking the mick. They're not being cheeky. All they're doing is creating a level playing field. So again, give someone like 25% extra time. It's a good standard, uh, but it allows someone the chance to solve the puzzle in their head first. Okay, autism. Now, autism honestly deserves its own webinar, um, or actually it would take a lot. I like to see autism as, you know when you have like a, um, a spoon and you look into it and it swaps the world upside down? It's kind of like that because when you see upside down, that's actually how the brain sees and the brain turns it around and sends that message to like, the, the eyes turns to the brain. So autism is kind of like, it's just not swapping it around and different processes and different like thought mechanisms gets blocked where others are more heightened. So autism is completely intentional. It's an actual an evolutionary advantage. Without autism, there wouldn't be, well, any innovation, I believe. Now, to show you guys a bit about how I see autism um, I've got a quick little thing for you. So if you're at Oxford Circus, what line would you take to Holborn? And now I appreciate not everyone lives in London. So here is the map. So Holborn to there. So looking at this, which colour line would most likely get you there fastest? And first of all, well done, everyone. You're obviously very London knowledgeable. Uh, yeah, so the central line makes the most sense. And how is this even relevant to autism? Well, it's relevant because a lot of people do not understand autism, so they automatically think it's wrong or something that needs fixing. 
when actually it's not it's a different way of doing things so if you're looking here for instance oxford circus um to holborn right looks like a straightforward example hop on the central line you'll be there in no time whereas someone with autism for example may start at oxford circus might go to bond street might nip down to green park might go to Westminster, might take the Thames Clipper up the river, might be the only person ever to go on the Emirates airline and eventually get to their final destination. Now that journey makes absolutely no sense. It's more expensive, it takes longer, it's wrong. But it's not because if you actually spoke took the time to speak with the individual, you might actually start to learn that potentially they knew there was delays happening. They knew that they get stressed in that, that line because it's really crowded and they wanted to take a more scenic route. They wanted to have more time to process because they're able to work better and get their work done while in motion. If you take the time to think about, um, yeah, if you take the time to ask someone, it, it's, it works far better. But it's really important to remember that not everyone currently knows how their mind works. So though they might not have an answer which satisfies you, know that there is a purpose and there is a reason behind it. All right, ADHD. So attention deficit hyperactive disorder. Now this is again, the brain kind of being hyper-focused it's kind of like when you've got those blinkers on and you can see what's in front of you and you can really do it well, but other things get amiss. A lot of people see ADHD as like the naughty condition, um, which just isn't true. All it is is that the brain knows what it's interested in. It knows what it finds exciting, what stimulates it. And if something isn't kind of like reaching onto those neurons, which keeps it excited, then it loses track. And this is why the normal kind of nine to five job, this is your task, bullet point, just doesn't work. If you, people with ADHD really flourish in roles which allow more innovation, allows more like management where you can choose what to do in your own time. Can you work on the weekends? Can you work in the evenings? Is there a one project that you're able to smash through first? When the brain gets a bit bored of that, can you go to another thing? And the advantages of ADHD is that if you manage to channel it in the right way, it can result in incredible um, productivity. But word of wise, it also, that with everything, there's pros and cons. Neurotypical people are like, you know, good all-rounders, where ADHD might be incredibly productive sometimes. It does mean that they're far more likely to burn out, and that's why they might need to take time off. So when you're, if you're an employer, this is why it's important that you treat every individual like an individual, because without that, you're going to run into burnout and no one wants that. Now, I would like to hear from you guys again. What are some strengths that are associated with being neurodivergent? Some interesting comments in the, in the comment section, by the way. Um, I'm secretly laughing in my head, but I uh, must carry on. All right, cool. So nice, interesting. So the vast majority of you are saying creative. Thinking outside of the box, intelligent, focused, analytical, problem solving, 3D thinking, oh, that's passionate, spatially empathetic, Wow. In, so the bigger the word, basically, the more of you that have said it. And all of these are absolutely correct. But it's also important to know that it's also very individual. So when, for instance, people say, oh, what's the benefits of dyslexia? Oh, it means you're creative. Well, not necessarily. There's some people who are dyslexic who are incredible writers. And the challenge of writing and reading actually pushes them more forward to make it the thing they love doing. Um, but typically it is about being creative and we don't just mean about arts here. You, you don't wanna just chuck every uh, neurodivergent person in an arts course. It's more about giving them a 
a role which allows them to use their brain, which allows them to come up with solutions. I always think, you know, if you, as long as you get to the destination, it doesn't matter the route you take, but you've got to be allowed to take different routes. Whereas normal jobs and colleges and processes allow for like one route. And that's normally where the difficulty happens. So what we covered in this section, recruitment processes can unintentionally discriminate. Autism is a different way of thinking. Positives relate to, there are lots of positives that relate to neurodiversity. Now going into our last part, we've got one group activity, an explanation on learning styles and a bit of feedback, so questions and answers. And yes, and that should work out nicely for time. So I would like to ask all of you, and we've got a really broad audience, including managers, directors, individuals who are neurodivergent, people who are just curious. What do you guys think might be the best support that you could give a neurodivergent colleague so they could work to their strengths? Let me into Zoom again, please. Okay, I don't know if that's the best. Well, I guess that could support neurodivergent people. Uh, let's see how I do that. Oh, wow. Okay, we did have some waiting. All right, apart from that, we've got ask them, find out what their strengths are, support them with tasks they struggle with, understanding and time, be kind, space and freedom. Right method and training based on their interests. Ask them what they need. Have uh, a one to one meeting with them. Listen to them. Listen to them. Understand. Understand. Presence willing, spoke, support. Give them space. Ask them to reasonably adjust. Try not to change them. Tailor the jobs. Space for freedom. Support them. Understanding and time. Okay, guys, really interesting. And every one of them would be really supportive. The best one that I like the most, which um, I, is this one, which is ask them. And the best way that is, is that I meet so often HR managers who have the world's best intentions, you know, they really mean well, but they try to make these adjustments without actually asking the individual. And lo and behold, the adjustment doesn't work. And it makes the person feel like they're being a pain, it makes a HR manager feel like, I just, you know, why do I even bother? But ask someone, they know their brain better than most people. But there are gonna be instances where the person doesn't understand the best way they work. And that's one of the things that we do at Exceptional Individuals. But also you can work with them, try things, trial and error. And whatever adjustment you make, make sure that that adjustment is open to the entire workforce. You never want to isolate one demographic over another. So you can't say like, all right, use this colored paper only for people who have diagnosed autism or dyslexia. It's got to be, well, it's there for everyone. Use it if you want. If, you if it helps, it helps. If it doesn't, don't use it. That's normally the best kind of way you can. Treat people equal. If you make life easier for one demographic, you should make life better for everyone. Preach. <laughs> All right, now, last bit, I saw a few questions. How can we actually make sure that we're engaging? How can we make our presentations more fun when we're having meetings, when we're teaching in schools? Now, you often hear about learning styles, but what does that really mean? Well, there's, there's a few different types. So visual. So Walt Disney was a visual thinker. And that meant like he was very great at being a visionary, but not always great at actually doing the work. He got everyone else to do it for him. But he's still gone down in history as one of the most creative people of all time. Albert Einstein, very logical. He, his personal skills weren't great. He had very sl slow development early on. But when it comes to logic, he was able to put all the pieces in his head in a way which 
was revolutionary. Um, we've got Winston Churchill, but kinesthetic. So he was dyslexic, or at least he says he was. Um, it's debated, but we'll say he is. And he, again, he got other people normally to write for him, to do all the admin, but he was able to engage people. He was able to really bring like subjects to life. And we find a lot of people with dyslexia, for example, tend to be an amazing public speakers because where they find other things difficult, other skills tend to go above and beyond. You should see my writing, it's awful. But um, as you can see, you can talk for England. And then lastly, auditory. So there, well, there is actually a few others, but these are the main ones. John Lennon, who's an absolute hero of mine, he learned through sounds. So the vast majority of all the music he created, he never wrote down. He could hear music and really listen to it and tell it as a story. And his kind of dyslexic way of thinking, along with Paul McCartney's, created the best band of all time. But that's just me getting passionate about my favorite band. So when you guys are creating work, I really recommend trying to make sure that you hit all of these ones. So if you're doing a presentation, include images, make sure there's firm bullet points that clearly outline what you want. B, make sure to break it up with a quiz, make it a bit more interesting. And if possible, while talking, you know, do a bit of variation in your voice. It makes it far more engaging. If you do this, I guarantee people will at least walk away from your meeting, your presentation, your pre whatever, remembering at least one thing. And that's the best way that our brain, our brains are like children, you know, they get bored easily. So you've got to be able to keep them engaged. And this works for everyone, not just people who are neurodivergent. How can exceptional individuals help you? Brilliant. I've taught you all this great stuff about neurodiversity, um, but you want some actual practical help. Well, we have support services. And if you're an organization, this includes a whole range of things, which I'll go into in a bit more detail. We have workplace needs assessments and different ways to support your employees. On this page is about how we mainly support uh, organizations. So if you are a manager, a director, a HR, and you're looking about, okay, where can I start off? Well, we help people recruit neurodiverse talent. And this isn't like, oh, you know, we could really do with a couple more autistics in the, in the firm. It is not like that. It's that you tell us what jobs you're struggling recruiting, and we look at the skills which resonate um, with different people. So if you are looking for a work, send your CV to us and we have great opportunities. And every person we put into work, we make sure that that organization is as inclusive and understanding as possible. So every organization we work with, it's mandatory that the directors and the senior managers all go through training. So everyone from top down understands different ways of learning. Then workshops and trainings. So I deliver a very similar workshop to this to managers and HRs, but more focused about how you can hire people, how can you attract different talent, how you can retain people. And these are very bespoke to each organization. We've done them to the likes of Universal Music, Ford, Kantar, um, government departments. And it's always really interesting to see the passion in the room. So many people leave their sessions thinking, you know what, I actually resonate a lot with that. That makes a lot of sense now, because as we learned, if it's one in seven, that's really high odds that somewhere or another, your brain thinks along the lines we've mentioned. We do audits. So what that means essentially is we will go through all of your systems and processes and just make sure that you don't unintentionally discriminate or alienate different ways of thinking any way along the journey. And there's also employee support. So it's all well and good getting people in the organization who are diverse. But if you do not have the kind of structure in place, it's not going to work. This is why we'll make sure that someone's full settled, is at ease, have the equipment they need, has training, has access to someone they can talk to whenever they need to. 
just like you have like support systems for mental health, you also need support for the things that neurodiverse diverse individuals find difficult. Or workplace needs assessment. This is something you can either do via the UK government or you can do as an independent, which is more perfect for those of you who are not in the UK. It's a government grant which can go up to like tens of thousands, but typically it's around about four and a half thousand. And this allows you to get the support right away. So all you need to do to access it is one, secure a job. It's open to full time um, and self-employed individuals, as well as a few others, but that's for like more niche. An assessment, that is when a lovely individual, maybe us, maybe someone else comes down and we'll have about an hour's conversation with the person and we'll find out what works for them and what doesn't work for them. And then we'll create a list of recommendations together so it's collaborative. Um, we'll apply for the grant, we do all the paperwork on the individual's behalf and then the training is provided. And this training could vary from work like equipment such as speech dictation software which I use to write all my emails. It could be soft skills, so learning how to organise your time better with one-to-one -one training. Or it even could be to make sure that your teams get training because you're not the problem, it's the understanding. So it's, it's a collaborative approach. And that said, this is open to everyone in the UK, normally for free if you're in the six weeks of applying. And if you're not in the UK, we can you know, talk to us and we can let you know roughly how much one costs to have it private. But essentially, it's a really good way to say, look, I need support. This, this independent in, um, organization recommends that this would help me greatly. Okay, and ways to support your colleagues, awareness training, education, education, education is so essential. Workplace needs assessments. Again, if you've got a bad back, they're normally more than happy to get you a special chair, but people don't often do assessments for people who think differently. And you should, you know, there's no reason why not. If it's being offered, by the government, it seems silly not to take them up on the offer. And you never know how long these things will stay around for. Also, you guys should look at a thing called Disability Confident. It's a government um, like stamp of approval that says, you know what, you are doing a good job. You have said you're going to hire inclusively. You're not going to discriminate. You're going to go the extra mile. It's not a foolproof thing, but it's a good starting point anyway. And it's something that you can work up to. There's three levels. There's disability confident, incompetent employer, and confident leader. Um, we're actually a confident leader at the moment. And it means we don't just make it easy for people to apply with different abilities. We, we actively encourage and support it. And accessible information. So what we mean by that is, the vast majority of people, there is support available, but they have no idea how to find it. And it's normally when, when issues happen and the HR manager will be like, well, we, we actually have this support available. Well, it's no good if you don't let people know. Put it on your website, put it on the applications, let people know that if they are neurodivergent, there is support available that can help them with the application process. And some adjustments. And Again, I can never tell people how to run their companies, even though it's kind of my job. Um, psychometric tests, get rid of them. Like they, they, all they do is create one cookie cutter mold of an individual. That isn't the way that you're going to create innovation. And you could also partner up with exceptional individuals. Wink. Um, we're more than happy to have a chat with any of you today, whether you're looking for work, looking to partner, or, or just want to have a good chin wag. Any questions? Now is a good time for you guys to write in here any questions you have, and myself or Matt will do our very best to answer as many as possible. Do you work with schools? We work with schools occasionally, but it's not our bread and butter. So it's something we do as like pro bono. Uh, we'll go in and do assemblies from time to time. So it's not something that we actively do, but it's not something we do not do.
but we do work a lot with school uh, universities and colleges can assessments be done remotely yes they can obviously in an ideal world you would do them face to face because you get a far more better understanding of the individual as well as their workplace so we recommend doing it in that person's workplace but it's not essential so yes remotely can be done and obviously during the pandemic we've been doing a lot well all of them remote how to deal with neurodiversity at school well it depends what kind of area you're coming from from a student's perspective or from a teacher but I would say without knowing the finer details it's more about really um, giving that up general awareness there's no point just educating teachers you, you've got to educate everyone like the students as well to understand that learning different is an advantage let's try and drop the labels so much so you don't have to say to guys we're learning about autism today but teach people, teach them that we're all different. We all think, and just because people have different ways of solving problems doesn't always, well, doesn't indicate intelligence. So I, for example, really do not like the class system, you know, where you've got like class, the high class, the lower class for different abilities. Because that always, for me, made me feel really stupid and dumb. And it's just because the way they taught didn't really kind of attach to my way of learning. Have you done work in the NHS? Yes, we have. Um, you know, webinar support. Uh, it's something we definitely want to do more of. So if you whoever wrote this, please get in touch, as I think this is such a huge area that we've only dabbled in. Predominantly, we've worked with government departments, but not directly with the NHS um, to the level that I would like to have worked with. How do you bro branch the subject with someone who does not think they are ND? Okay, well, first of all, again, drop the labels. If you go up to someone and say, mate, I think you might be autistic, you're never going to get a good response because people do not see it as a badge of honour. But if you go up to someone and say, I notice that you learn in this way, or how do you think you learn best? Hmm, that's interesting. What could we do to help you? By coming at it from that angle, it's far more inclusive and it doesn't kind of like, well, attach a label to someone. How often do these webinars take place? So we've got one every fortnight up until September, uh, but then it's kind of at least once a month. And they're completely free. Normally they're aimed at people who are neurodivergent looking for free, looking for support. But this is just a bit of a taster today for organizations. Um, but normally we go into far more detail. The one-to-one -one is before you get a job, um, but it also can be once you get a job and we can support you in. It's just, it just changes. So one's about getting support in work, one's about actually helping you find an employer that you like and is inclusive and you'll have a really nice life. If the individual had previously had access to work for a different condition, can they have a new one for another condition? Yes. So you can apply for access to work, I think really as many times as you want for new employers. And also if, um, if your circumstances change. So for example, I had one done for my uh, dyslexia and I actually didn't find it helped very much. So I went back to them and they redid an assessment and to find out equipment that actually would benefit me. Having a list of common accommodations would be helpful as I have no idea what is already out there. Is there something you have on your website? Well, we have a blog which has covered, which lovely uh, April who's here writes a lot of as well as myself. And it has a lot of ideas there. So there's ones like top 10 dyslexic hacks or um, what equipment is best for people with dyspraxia. Uh, I would say that's a really good starting point. And we do have a list of equipment which we use regularly, though it's not an exhaustive list. I would say, I, the reason I don't like overly recommending things is that it's always a bit of a cocktail. It's about trying different things out for what works with you. It's one of the reasons where we don't like promote any particular brands because it really depends on you. I can pick some up now. I've got them on my phone here. Oh, so please do, Matt. Please do. Um, is access to work available for freelancers, self-employed, and contractors? Yes, it definitely is. Um, there are some requirements that you need, though. One is you either have to have turned over six thousand plus pounds in pounds in the past year, 
or have a business plan showing that for the next two or three years. And it really depends on the advisor you get to how, um, how, how much detail that needs to go into, but you definitely can. I'll put the link in. We can help you with that application as well. Okay. How do you, how do you get an access to work assessment with you guys? As the one I had was with RNIB was a poor experience and knew nothing about the conditions and what I needed. The thing is, if you just phone up access to work, access to work normally, they basically have a whole database of people and we're one of them and they'll just kind of like put you in any odd one. And the thing with that is it's just pan disability and it's not neurodivergent focused. So we are neurodiverse experts. Uh, so if you want one via us, the best thing to do is go on our website and you can request uh, to have one. And that way we'll act as your advocate or third party and go and make sure that you are allocated with us. And I would recommend that to someone who's neurodivergent. If you have a co-occurring condition and say have a physical disability as well, what we do is we collaborate with someone who is an expert in that area together to come up with a really detailed report, which will benefit. Do you do the support sessions for access to work? Uh, we do for some of them, yes, not all of them. Um, we do a lot of like soft skills um, and individual coaching and training. Uh, this can be done either at your office or you can come to ours or we can meet at a coffee shop, wherever you feel most comfortable. How do you deal with neurodiversity in older age and also in supporting siblings growing up? Hmm. Well, I must say it's more challenging the older you get because you've been like the way your brain, you've been conditioned to think negatively for so many years. We meet people with such low self-esteem because of the way the world has treated them. So what I would do is treat them just like I would any other person, but I would spend far more time at the beginning to really work on the confidence element and to like try to refigure the way that they see it. People that are asking for jobs, yeah, there's a jobs page on our site and, and we can help you with that. Neurodiversity at school, like we said, it's not something we do often. We do go and do talks at assemblies and things. There's few around schools. Um, we have a lot around access to work. Uh, so we're happy to take those questions afterwards. Uh, Nat, there's one on whether people should disclose. Someone said, should I divulge my dyspraxia to an employer prior to commencing my contract? Okay, well, that's a, a really interesting one. Should you disclose? And I said, the honest answer is that in an ideal world, yes. But in the real world, it depends. So do your research beforehand. How inclusive is the organization? Um, what I mean by this is, do they have a network of neurodiversity or disability? On their website, do they mention that they have inclusive hiring practices? If you go on Glassdoor, um, which is a review website, has anyone said anything positive or negative? And if, then, if there's good ideas that it's working, then you should, um, I think disclosure has so many benefits because it means you can get support very early on. The thing I would mention though is, if you are disclosing, do not disclose and expect them to understand. Disclose and educate them what you mean when you say you have, say, ADHD, because everyone has their own views and opinions. So it really is important to know that. Now, if the organization doesn't look inclusive, it can discriminate, you know, people can be very discriminative. I would like to think that if you found them to be that way, it might not be the organization you want to apply for. Because eventually the co companies who are most inclusive will get the best talent. So it, it will eventually sort itself out. So short answer, I would, I would disclose. And if they don't accept it well, well, I think that says enough about their organization for you to make an informed decision. When you're having an interview, remember, it's very much about them interviewing you, but also you interviewing them to make sure that the job is the right fit for you. All right, guys. So on this screen now is for the feedback. Um, we are always practicing, always growing and always developing. I appreciate my internet was a bit dodgy today. So thank you so much for putting up with me. 
Um, I'm back in the old family house, and uh, I must say, our good old neighbours are letting us borrow their internet. So, uh, yeah, well, they are. Yeah, yeah, so we're doing well. But on the phones, if you could just rate it overall, how would you find it? The presenter, the content, the interactions, ease to use. Really pleased with all these. Um, great stuff. If you guys have any more detailed feedback, we will send a, um, a type form to ask later on. And Matt will also send you a link to the spiky profile. But please do get in touch. During these challenging times, it can be extra isolating to have a different way of thinking. So having a community where we can all come together, be it people who are, um, who have it, think they have it, are empathetic or allies. Yeah, thank you everyone for coming from myself as well. This is the first one we've done with so many people. Um, so obviously we will work on any technical issues in the future. Um, for the spiky profile element, I talked at the, the start, something we're really excited about and we'll be sending out in terms of one-to-one -one coaching, if you're looking for work, we've just extending our team to be able to support with the increased uh, rates of people that need our support at the moment. So um, we're taking on another six or seven job coaches. So um, if you do need support, please please do email your CV in. You'll get an email straight back offering to book a one-to-one. -one. And for those employers out there that are here today, uh, if we can assist with anything in any way, I know at the moment as well around working from home for a lot of your colleagues and staff. Um, it's a new environment for them. So we're there to, to help if, if anything is needed at all. Great. Well, see, guys, it's been absolutely fantastic to have everyone here. To see such a massive number of people interested to learn more is always uplifting. Uh, so right now, I'm going to unmute everyone so it can go into chaos, um, but feel free to talk and hang out for a little longer until half past. Yeah, stay in touch, guys. You've been amazing. I just want to say thank you to everybody. Um, I found it really, really useful. Um, I'm the person who works as a clinician within the NHS, and I am really, really keen to bring this forward. Um, I've been asked to do a presentation because I'm recently diagnosed, and um, there's due to the COVID, the pressures at work, etc. There's been a lot of things that have been causing isolation for myself and other colleagues who were diagnosed. So I've been asked to do a equality and diversity uh, presentation next week. Brilliant. Well, That's I great. Think helpful. Yeah, if we can help with anything, let us know around that. If you need any more information, please do email. Oh, I certainly will do. I'm so glad I've seen this today. Oh, no, I, honestly, we're all, we're, as I like said, we're very passionate about it. And there is a massive community feeling growing. And I think every day people are switching on. And what we're trying to do is create a world which doesn't just accept neurodiversity, but utilizes it and really harnesses it to, for the better. So if you are an organization, a lot of the times people will say, oh, but you know, money. And we, what we would say is, well, you're going to be losing out if you do not become inclusive. If you do not start tapping into these different ways of thinking, other companies are going to have the competitive advantage. And they are starting to listen, and we are seeing a fantastic movement um, happening at this time. We really are here as a team, and you might think, I've tried that, doesn't work. Well, you haven't tried everything. It takes a lifetime of trying things that do and do not work. One, and we'll get there. But guys, before I won't let this drag out any longer, I really hope you all enjoyed. If you enjoyed, do a little reaction like that. Whee! And it's, yes. And uh, that gives me, yes, Beverly, she's going crazy. <laughs> so yeah, uh, really appreciate it all. So stay in touch and have a lovely day. And um, hopefully see you guys at the next one. Bye all. Thank you.